I'd like to thank everyone for coming to join us on our KIPPS Manitoba student event on how to future-proof your IT career. Uh, we have an awesome panel here with uh, Adam Gerhard from Red River College Polytechnic, Dana Chapman from Princess Auto Limited, and KIPPS' own Greg Glain, uh, who's the CEO of KIPPS Canada's Association of IT Professionals. We're also lucky to have Lori Wheeler here, who is our moderator uh, from uh, Tech Manitoba. I'm Jonathan Elias, and I'll be providing a brief overview of the uh, agenda today. Uh, prior to doing so, I'd just like to briefly mention KIPPS's uh, Associate Information Technology Professional designation, uh, which is for recent graduates of uh, IT programs, especially those who graduated from a KIPPS accredited program. Uh, they're eligible for the AITP and one year of uh, candidate free candidate membership. And those who graduated from non-KIPS accredited programs can also obtain the AITP by applying for candidate membership and having their education reviewed by KIPS. Uh, you can learn more about the AITP designation at cips.ca slash AITP. Now, in terms of the agenda, we'll start with a brief introduction of the speakers. Uh, the speakers will then each share some of their insights. Uh, and then we'll turn over to Lori, who will also have some moderator questions for the panel. Then finally, we'll have a Q&A portion at the end, uh, where we kindly ask that uh, throughout this event, you type your questions in the chat. Uh, and then at the uh, Q&A portion, we'll compile your questions. And uh, Lori will uh, ask the, the panel um, the various questions that you've provided. So on that note, um, I'll turn it over to Laurie. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone to Future Proof Your IT Career. Now, before we get started on a conversation with our panelists, I thought it might be kind of interesting just for um, everyone here to take a second and post in the chat a job that you have had in your career. I, I get it that for some of you, the only job that you may have had so far is a paper route, but let's just take a second, um, put something in the chat, either a great job that you had, a super bad job that you had. Panelists, if you want to play along, just do the same. Um, because I think, and if you don't know, I'm sure by now everybody knows Zoom, that that little chat, that little speech bubble, that's where to uh, put your notes. Um, because I think that we will all really quickly see as you read through all these uninspired jobs that landing a great job or having a really meaningful career, it's not a linear path. There's a great quote that says, I'm a collector of quotes. Um, and it says, you cannot be anything that you want, but you can be everything that you are. And one of the reasons why I wanted to start with this is because I love that every single job that you experience in your life becomes a part of who you are and it contributes to your success. And sometimes it contributes to your success because you've had amazing colleagues, you've had great bosses. Sometimes it contributes because you learn exactly what not to do, what you don't want. So, but it all makes up um, who you are and who you are expands over time. Um, and I actually wanted to just, interrupt myself for just a second to say part of who you are by choosing to show up with us tonight there's a million options of what you could do tonight and you chose to show up and I think you're going to hear from every single one of our panelists that part of what's going to make your career successful is taking initiative showing up and being the kind of person who learns from others like this panel of individuals has an extraordinary breadth of experience and so high five, big applause to every single one of you that's here tonight. I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. So the panel is going to speak tonight about her, how circuitous the pathway was to their career. It's one of the ways that um, success is not a linear path. And again, another quote that I, was, I wanted to just leave with you before we um, start to introduce the panelists is by Charles Darwin. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. 
So keep that in mind. Um, So I'm going to first introduce Diana, Diana Chapman, Senior VP of IT and Solution Delivery with Princess Auto. And Diana, maybe just give us a few words about your circuitous path to success. Absolutely. Thank you for the great inter- introduction. And I really like how you started us off with uh, having everybody tell us what they've done in, in their past careers or um, before they got on their, their career path journey. Um, so like Laurie said, my career absolutely zigzagged. Um, I was recently asked to summarize my career path journey in one word, and it's not very easy, but because um, there's such it's such tough, like I came up with like fulfilling and rewarding and challenging, exciting, evolving. But in the end, I think I landed on unexpected um, and not because it wasn't planned. I've always had goals and I've always had sort of a path I thought I would follow. Um, but I never could have dreamed of the opportunities that I've had and the incredible people that I've been able to work with. Um, so I graduated from um, the computer analyst program, uh, program at Red River Community College, and my first job was a computer operator. I worked 12-hour shifts. I worked 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and then I worked 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., and uh, they were very long days, and you never knew if you're coming or going. Um, but within six months, I got an opportunity to uh, be a programmer, and then uh, my IT career just went from there, was programmer analyst, systems analyst, IT lead, um, and then found um, that I was very passionate about leadership and project management. Um, took my master's in project management, got my PMP designation, and then that just opened all kinds of doors to even to lead uh, leave IT. So did network engineering, uh, marketing, computer op- or uh, customer operations, transformation. And uh, these roles gave me the opportunity and confidence to learn more about the business, develop new relationships, and really evolve my own leadership style. Um, and like I said, my career path has zigged and zagged many times. And it's important to have goals, but it's also to keep an open, important to keep an open mind and don't be afraid to try new opportunities. You just never know um, which door you open and where you're going to go and, and uh, who you're going to meet and what you're going to learn. So um, now I've come full circle back in my career, back to IT and leading a, a project management office, and uh, I'm absolutely thrilled. So um, in a quick summary, that's, that's my career journey. Yeah, that's an interesting career journey. Like you say, uh, lots of zigs and zags. So thank you for that. I'd like to introduce you to Greg Lane next. He's the CEO of Canada's Association of IT Professionals. So my career is like Diane's, all over the place where Diane is. Uh, I worked mostly in grocery stores going through school. Um, And when I was going to college, I worked night crew Uh, till late in the morning and then went right to class and then tried to find some time during the day to uh, sleep. My very first job after school was a statistician for the Department of Statistics Canada and I was literally in the bowels of a building so far underground that I don't even know how many floors were above me before we could see daylight and somebody called me and said would I be interested in a job in, in technology and I went sure went to an interview and that was my career path. I, like Diana, zigged and zagged from technology sales to product management to strategic planning. I had a chance to work overseas um, in New Zealand for a few years. And in every one of those instances, I probably wasn't really looking for work. Somehow I found jobs or people found me or (laughs) something happened and I said yes. So it was uh, exactly the same, zigging and zagging all over, not just the industry, but over the world, in fact. So uh, not a conventional path by any means. The key was saying yes, right? Listening to what the world is attracting to you and saying yes. Uh, Adam Gerhardt is the CIO at Red River College Polytech. Let's hear your story, Adam. Yeah, kind of thanks, uh, Lori. And kind of similar. I think it's it's all about there's a little bit of planning in our in, in my career and a lot of taking advantage of what what presents itself because you never really know what's going to come. So I I uh, took my computer science degree at University of Manitoba. Uh, my first co-op work term was with MTS. I think I actually sat two cubicles over from Diana, uh, and so uh, yeah, that's that's where we go back to. 
and I uh, had a few co-op uh, terms there. Co-op is a great uh, opportunity just to get out there and try a few things. Uh, I started um, my paid career really uh, at the help desk at ISM at the time. It was bought out by IBM. And I stayed at IBM for about 12 years doing lots of things. I progressed up uh, after the help desk into second level support, uh, development analysis, and then into architecture, uh, starting designing things and leading, leading more teams as, as we went. Um, as I was progressing there, uh, I had a fella called me who owned a medical company. We had been on a trip to Cuba, uh, I'm going to say six months earlier or so, and he called me up and said, do you actually know what I do? And I said, I don't really know what you do. We, we had a good time with them on the trip. I, I have a medical company. We, uh, we have clinics and I need someone to come who has medical experience and clinic management experience to come and, and lead one of our clinics. And I said, I don't have any of that. He said, good, you'll be perfect. And so I went <laughs> and left IT and went into medical clinic management. Uh, that was uh, that was really interesting, and, I, and in that organization, I it was a smaller organization, home healthcare type of stuff. Uh, moved up in that organization and became VP of IT and then VP of corporate services, uh, which sounds really impressive. But remember, it's 100 people, so I, I was VP of like four people um, in IT. But still, it was really interesting to work in an organization like that. And I, as I was there, I took my MBA and and progression to leadership there. Um, at some point, you sort of been with an organization, and, and I was looking for a different opportunity, and I applied. There was a position at the University of Manitoba for a director of planning and governance, which sounded like a really exciting job. Um, so that's why I applied for it, And because uh, planning and governance, who does not want to do that? So I applied for that and was successful, and that, again, was a, a combination of opportunity that presented itself, but some interesting sort of uh, path that I'd taken in my career, interesting um, things that I had. And so I worked there for a bit and I, I worked on some national things there as well. And then uh, I thought that higher ed might be a place I wanted to stay and, and ultimately be a CIO and was starting to prep for that. And then the Red River College job came up and I wasn't ready yet, uh, but there's only so many post-secondary CIO positions in the province. And so I pretty much had to, uh, and I had great support from my CIO at U of M with that and applied and was successful there. And so uh, that's how I got to be where I am. Very, you know, taking advantage of some things that came up, and and uh, also doing a little bit of sort of preparing and stuff for for what might come. Yeah, that's that's great. And another another uh, case uh, in support of saying yes to challenges. Yeah. So I'm going to pose some questions to you, and um, like I'll, I'll direct a question to one of you, but feel free to add a little bit of color commentary, and then again to all the students and the rest of the audience. Um, like Jonathan had mentioned, just feel free to put some questions into the uh, chat and I'll try and catch, uh, make notes of them as, as they go along. So um, Diane, I'm gonna direct this question to you. Um, share with us something that you wish that somebody had shared with you when you were a student or a new grad. Absolutely, great question. Um, and I've got lots. <laughs> Being in the field for, for 25 years, you learn a lot and as you go and, and some by trial and error and some just from mentors. But um, for me, it's been really important to build credibility and respect. Um, so you just you do what you say you're going to do. You set some expectations. Um, also, be curious and don't be afraid to ask questions. Challenge the status quo and, and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, making mistakes is how you you grow and, and uh, sometimes other opportunities come out of mistakes. Um, attitude is everything. Um, I have an, a quote that's my favorite, Laurie, and it's uh, from Helen Keller, and it's optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. And, and for a long time, I had that up on my, my whiteboard and I had it, it uh, framed. It just really something inspired me. Um, and also something that um, from when I was a little girl, my granny in her garden had a little sign that said, bloom where you're planted. And when I was little, I took that literally. Like I just, I thought that just means you plant something and it grows there. But uh, as I got older, I realized that you don't always get to choose your role or choose your position or the situation you're in, but you can choose how you react to that and, and take every opportunity um, or view every role as an opportunity, um, grow and develop, do the best that you can wherever you are and uh, develop new relationships. Um, that'll take you very far in your career. Um, and then the last one I have really, the question that I get asked so much about is about balance, work-life balance. And how do you do that? How do you do that when you have families and, and you're supporting parents or children or communities? And, and 
this is something that I kind of came to learn myself and it served me very well. And it's keep your head where your feet are. It's just be present where you are. If you're at work, trust that your children, your parents, whatever is outside of work is safe and being cared for. Um, and then when you're at home, do the same, be present, um, show up, um, pay attention to, to where you are and what you're doing. I would use my commute time as a transition time. So as I was driving to work, I was thinking about what I wanted to accomplish for the day and how I wanted to set my priorities. And I would stay focused at work on what was important. And then on the way home, I do the same, but in reverse, think about what I need to do in the evening, what's important to me, where I wanted to spend my time and making sure that I was present and that I showed up. That's, I, think you, I think you have like four quotes there I can add to my quote collection. <laughs> like keep your head where your feet are. That's a really great one. Yeah. That's Does anybody wanna to add to that, Adam? I just, I, the bloom where you planted it, that's when it's always struck me. I think no matter where you are, you're going to be in situations that some of them are going to be awful and some of them are going to be work related. Hope if, they're, if they're like personally awful, do something about that. But work, you're going to get some stuff that's not great and some stuff that's really exciting. But you have to take make the most, most of those situations and really, really bloom wherever, whatever, whatever you're handed, make the most of it. And I would just reinforce that too. When I interview people, the question around success is something I, I want to understand if success is important and if they have a history of success, because I believe it's it's a repeated capability. So to Adam's point and Diana's point too, when you're in a job and you're successful in that job and you are part of that success, that's an attitude or an experience that you bring to every organization you're going to work with. And that's something that really helps a team, right? Seeing that somebody wants to be and is trying to be successful, but it lifts everybody. So I just reinforce the same points. Great words of wisdom. Success is repeatable. I agree with that. That's, that's a good one, Greg. Um, Greg, you talk about durable skills and I really actually like that phraseology of yours because it's not just soft skills. These really are durable skills. But um, share with our audience what you mean by that and why durable skills matter. Well, it's like you, I've, I've heard for many years, there's technical skills or, or soft skills and they're contrasted. And I, I don't really agree with those two kind of labels. Technical skills, yes, you can learn about a technology and you can be an expert, quotation marks, in a technology. Um, and technology keeps evolving. You might change to a different organization which might have a different technology. So it's something that you, you have to continually relearn. When you learn how to deal with people, when you learn how to make a presentation, when you have a mental process for making decisions, those are what I call durable skills. Those mm -hmm. stay with you and they keep getting better and better and better as you change jobs, change careers, advance in your career, all those kinds of things. So, I really love to hear about how people have developed a process for how they decide what to do. And I ask questions about that. How do they work in a team? Describe the best team you've worked in. And when I hear them talking about their role and how they support other, those are the kinds of skills in my mind, durable skills. They travel with you, they stay with you and they get better over time. And I believe that would, that's what really differentiates good and great performers. Mm. Does anybody want to add to that note? I really like that phrase, durable skills, because um, you're right, technical skills, um, you can pick them up fairly easily. You can take a course, read a book, um, but the durable skills, the soft skills, the leadership skills, those are things that you learn over time and they really, um, they reflect your values and they help you connect with people. And, and I think if you can connect um, the soft skills, the durable skills, and the, and the technology skills um, that sets you up to be a great leader or just a great team member. Yeah. Adam, we're going to um, speak to you. We know that you, we know in the beginning, like you were super keen uh, about technology, um, but nobody works in a vacuum. And you've mentioned that it really was human relationships that shaped your career. So we heard at the beginning a, a little abbreviated version of that, but talk a little bit about how human relationships led to a successful career. Yeah. So I was, was going to try to find a picture of this when I, this is about how keen I was about technology when I was in like 
I don't know, grade 10 or something like that. I made myself business cards that had Adam Gerhard Programming Corporation because I was writing like I was writing code in basic and stuff like that. And, you know, and anyway, that was how keen I was. You are keen. Uh, yeah, I am keen. Uh, yeah. So the thing I, I think everybody probably knows this, but technology really is never the thing. It's never the point of what we're doing, even though our careers are in technology and we're doing technology. Um, it's always about the goal and the end goal. So uh, when we're advancing, uh, even when you're when our careers, even if we're dealing with deep technology stuff, we have to be able to explain ourselves to other people. We have to be talking about it. And in fact, even if we're, it's even more important if you're deep technical because nobody really knows what you're talking about. So you have to be able to explain yourself to help you build some relationships to, to uh, expand your career and continue and to get senior leaders and stuff like that on board. You have to advocate and that kind of stuff. So it's always about those relationships. When I started on the uh, help desk, I realized firsthand how much technology impacts people, especially when they don't really understand it or it's done poorly um, because the help desk gets all of the results of that. And so you have to help these people through. So I think my advice is everyone should start on the help desk uh, to really get a sense of that. But um, there is some real importance of that uh, uh, in terms of how we affect people. So it's about the relationships again. The other piece is around uh, leadership. You don't need to be in a leadership role to be a leader. There's lots of people in, the, in, in organizations, we call them informal leaders. Um, because you can take initiative, you can build trust, and that helps you be seen and be known and to take on more exciting roles. If you can build trust amongst your teammates, that gets noticed. If you can build trust with your leaders, that gets noticed. Uh, and you can be more effective with that when you have that kind of trust in that leadership. The idea of preemptively solving problems for people, too, to, to really mm -hmm. take initiative for that. Um, when I think about the relationships I've had with some really great managers, uh, the idea of managing up comes up. So if people haven't looked at this and uh, I'd encourage you to, to take a hard look and figure out how you can figure out how to manage up. That's you managing your manager to make sure that you can be as effective mm -hmm. as possible with them. Uh, and the last thing I'd, I'd note about the relationships is the, the only reason I've got to where I am is because people have helped me in, in my career. I've been mentored. I've had people who've given me a chance, people who've trusted me, who've taken a, uh, who've guided me, who've encouraged me, who've took the time to be, taking the time to be real with me when I've needed that. I, I hate the I hate networking. I really hate networking events. Um, but that networking is so important. Despite the fact that you have business cards. Despite the fact that I have business cards, I still have all my business cards. I get whenever I go to a or new organization, I get like my box of business cards and I give them out to my mom and you know my friends, and then I keep the rest of them for me. Um, no, I yeah, the networking events, I, there's there's an importance to them, and especially when you get into some more senior roles. There's some there's some relationships that really do get built up there. But as you're starting out in your career, they're really tough. Um, but that authentic long game where you're building relationships with your peers, where you've worked beside someone in your first co-op term and then meet them 25 years later to do a panel discussion, mm -hmm. it's that, I mean, this is, that's a pretty long game. But there are some, some things like that where you can, you can build those relationships and you, you can have those uh, relationships with people and they uh, build that trust. And I'd say don't be afraid to reach out to people. So in organizations, often managers and leaders will say, we want to hear from you. Um, you know, here's an opportunity. Let us know. Um, we at the college have have coffee with, with the senior leadership team that people can reach out and have that. It, it's surprising how little that is taken advantage of. Do that. People want, as leaders, we want to be, we want to have that kind of engagement. We want to provide those opportunity for people. I was always freaked out by managers and senior leaders. I wouldn't want to talk to them. But the crazy secret is that um, now that I have this fancy pants title, there's not much difference between me and the people I lead. Uh, and I, the, the only difference is really is I have the responsibility to make the decisions because I've, I've, that's the job I have, the role I have, but the people around me are really the smart people who know what's going on. So I have to engage them and want to engage them. So reach out to your senior leaders and your leadership and, and, uh, and ask them and, and engage with them. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, Diane, I want to ask you about leadership, but maybe, um, you can maybe speak on that a little bit because you are a leader. Now you lead a team more than you work in, in the tech side of things. Um, so I'm interested in terms of what qualities make you a good leader, but I'm also interested in the transition from what Adam's saying is um, where he's saying leaders actually do want to hear from you. So I'm just interested if you would concur with that and then tell us a little bit about the sort of qualities that you think um, have really made you a good leader. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Laurie. Um, I liked what Adam said about um, it's not about the technology. 
And uh, it took me a long time to understand that. So now that I'm in a leadership role, I'm no longer uh, an expert in technology. Um, I count on my team for their technical expertise. Um, and it really wasn't an easy transition to let that go and not to get in the weeds and, and be the person with the solution all the time. Um, now I see my role more as a business partner and using that technology to enable solutions for the business, um, whether technology is as a platform or a system or, or whatever it is. Um, and finding that it's just like Adam said too, it's so important to build those relationships, um, not just with your teams or with your coworkers or, or with senior leaders, but for me, I always find it um, always important to develop relationships with my vendor partners as well. Um, I see them as an extension of my team and, uh, and I treat them that way. Um, part of my role that I, I love the most is, is providing the guidance, the coaching, the mentoring, the sponsorship, like all of the, the durable skills that, that Greg was talking about. Um, as you get further and further away from the technology, you need to trust your teams and you need to um, remove barriers for them and empower them to, to make decisions and, and you need to inspire confidence in them. And um, one um, um, the quote, not a quote, but um, I've, I've recently been thinking about uh, momentum and how it's, it's so important for collaboration. And um, uh, I have here written, make momentum together through collaboration. So bringing people together, setting goals together, and then executing quickly together, because momentum is a really powerful force. And if you have everybody on the same path, going the same way, thinking the same way, um, executing the same way, you're just removing roadblocks um, left, right, and center mm -hmm. um, because change is hard. And, uh, and if you can get people on board early and, and get them excited about what you're doing, the momentum you gain from that is invaluable. And also for, for myself, I like to, to foster an environment um, where people can be creative and bring new ideas and uh, challenge the status quo and ask why we do things the way we do things. Because that's where the great ideas come from is when you give people the space to, to be creative and, and to challenge. Um, and I've also, for me as a leader, I found it's been very important for me to be authentic and always just stick to my values and um, really treat people how I've always wanted to be treated wherever I was in my career path, um, just with respect and listening and, and, and always having an open door and being approachable. Yeah, I, I, I like that um, that authenticity piece it is really critical. And I would actually share or ask um, Adam and Greg, did you find, um, in order to be authentically you, was there more that you had to be of a leader? Like, were there, were there ways that you had to change? Were there, were there new perspectives that you had to take on? Like one of the things Adam said is those people used to be the fancy pants and now he's the fancy <laughs> pants. So like, was there a, is there a change in thinking that you had to adapt in order to excel as a leader? Like just to build on what Diana was saying, I'm just curious what you would add to that. Well, yeah, I think, uh... I think a lot of it's about attitude and and, and confidence because because there isn't anything magic between the stuff that I do. I mean, I, I have a certain experience and, and career path that, that has taken me to where I am. And so I'm in a role now that I'm confident and capable in because of my experience, but it's it's confident. And I, I had to be confident in my skill set in order to be able to do that. Mm. No one else is going to be confident for me. And I have to say, stick up my hand and say, yeah, I, I can do that or, or I can give that one a shot. Uh, and so I think, I think there is, I think there's a lot of attitude that people need, like a good attitude, but attitude that need, people need about your own abilities to deliver. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And so problem solving, I think that's one of the areas where leadership has to be engaged in a room and, and bring the best out in the people other than yourself and maybe yourself as well in the room. And so I've always been a big believer in lateral thinking. I, I don't really know what creativity is because it's not a spontaneous combustion kind of thing. I believe that you can actually learn how to think laterally and use that for problem solving. And the one thing I, I've probably learned over the years is problem solving requires good problem definition. So many times I've been in rooms where we've been trying to solve a problem and we'd have to do a pause and say, hang on, 
what exactly is the problem that we're trying to solve? And it, it sometimes is a, a bit of a revelation that we're, maybe we hadn't defined the problem correctly in the first instance and we were trying to solve the wrong thing. So I love lateral thinking. I love problem solving. I love allowing teams and supporting teams to be creative. And, and that's when I think you get your best work, especially around stuff like problem solving. Mm -hmm. so I think I was just going to say, if, if for folks that are, especially starting out your IT career, if you're invited into conversations like that, I mean, first, first of all, you can do that with your teams, but if you're ever invited into conversations, go to those things and be part of that and, and participate well in those. Those are, that's where you start to get noticed and you can start to really make a difference. Let's go back to the very beginning. Say yes. If you yes, get the say invitation, yes. say yes, show up. Yeah. I'm going to stick with Greg because actually one of the very first questions I saw float into the chat was from an international student. And Greg, we all talk about networks and how important your network is and how important um, it is to uh, excel in your career by getting to know people. But when you're a new graduate or when you're a new Canadian, there you don't have much of a network. So um, we'd love to hear from you in terms of just some advice about how you go about establishing it that all important network? Well, I can give you a, my experience. I, I mentioned earlier that I had a chance to work in New Zealand, another say yes. So when I arrived in New Zealand and we landed in Auckland and I'm taxiing in and I'm looking around and taking a taxi downtown to meet the team, I'm looking at the buildings. I don't even know who these companies are. I'm seeing names that I've never seen before, like a Fisher Paykel. I couldn't tell you, I can now, but I couldn't tell you then who they were, what did they do? So I literally arrived in New Zealand and I didn't know a person. And I'd worked in the same company for about 15 years at that point. And so I didn't have a lot of experience building networks. Networks came to me because in a job people, you meet people. So I realized quickly that the only way I was gonna be able to <laughs> survive in fact, was to learn really quickly about the culture, the organizations, as much as I could, as quickly as I could. So I joined things. I joined New Zealand Institutes of, of Marketing. I joined Sales and Marketing Executives International. I joined organizations that were in the industry I was in or related industries and developed a whole bunch of relationships very quickly. I was, at the time anyway, deemed as an attractive new addition to some of these organizations because I had an accent. Now, nobody on this call, my hope anyway, would see me as having a distinctive accent, but in New Zealand, I was considered a bit of an interesting case. So I was often asked to introduce guest speakers or play a role, and that's where I found the most value. Once I started contributing, not just joining, but contributing, being a part of the organization, meeting people, and Diana made the point earlier, when somebody asks you to do something and you do it, and you do it as well as you can, then people start to really trust you, like you, introduce you to things, and are quite willing to help you. So if you ask them a question, because you've helped them, they would help you. So joining associations that are relevant and, and contributing to that association and meeting as many people as you can and contributing to that organization will allow you to use that network or those people to further your career because you're gonna further theirs too. So it, just a little, for instance, for me. You know, one of the things that Diana had mentioned near the beginning was about don't be afraid to fail. But we all are afraid to fail. I mean, I have failed spectacularly in my life. And here I am. I've survived. I'm quite fine. But um, uh, looking back, I'm just going to put this out to any of you is um, are there things you would have done differently? Well, actually, let's put it this way. Is there a failure that benefited you? Um, is there something that maybe was totally embarrassing but turned out to be a great thing? Or um, what would you have done differently? So um, anybody that wants to take that one on, please just step up and... None of us want to admit. <laughs> I was going to say, I see Adam smiling, so I think he has an answer. Or maybe so many, Adam, I'm not sure if you should say it. So many to choose from. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the problem, right? And I think, I think for me, it's. Um, I mean, there's certain there's there's lots of failures that I've learned from. I'm not sure if I do things differently 
I mean, yes, I would. So one failure we had, I had, an, I was part of a team that put a big proposal in for a, to win a contract, and it was really important to the organization. We, it's our, the the life of the organization really depended on it. We didn't get it, uh, and there was lots of reasons why. And I was part of the failure, as was uh, several uh, several other people. And I certainly learned a lot. And it, the the how we handled it afterwards in terms of um, tuning the organization that now needed to be smaller than it was. Um, and the, the it was really powerful for me in terms of the kindness that we had to treat the staff with yet still being really uh, strong in terms of trying to save the organization quite literally. Um, but I don't know that I'd do it. I mean, other than doing it differently and winning, um, I don't know if I, if I would do it differently. I, I think you have to, you deal with these things and you, and you learn from them and you, and you move along. Um, so I don't know if that's, there's certainly been lots like that that I've that I've absolutely learned from. Um, some embarrassing may have changed the embarrassing ones, but the things like that where it's it's a learning thing. It's hard mm -hmm. to figure out what it would be different. Everything would be so different if that if that could be changed. Did you have a story you wanted to share, Diana? I was going to say the old hindsight is twenty twenty, right? <laughs> um, you know what? I was trying to think. I've had lots of. Um, again, in my more IT days of implementations that have gone sideways or, or doing upgrades to websites where you say, oh my gosh, you can't bring down our e-commerce site, we'll lose X amount of money. And then there it goes, down it goes. And, and it's all how you handle yourself in that situation, how you handle others around you, right? It's not, there's no finger pointing. We're all in this together. It's, it's don't look back, let's move forward. How do we move forward from here? And uh, after all the dust is settled, what have you learned and what would you have done differently? Or could you have prepared and had a better mitigation plan or a back out plan? But, um, but really it's, it's, for me, it's always been um, no blame, no finger pointing. What have we learned? What would we do differently if we had to go through this again? And sometimes like Adam said, sometimes there's nothing you would do differently. It's, it's maybe just having a better plan B or mitigation plan or, um, but yeah, I think, like I said earlier, um, every failure is an opportunity, opportunity to learn and grow. And sometimes from those failures, they open other doors. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating because the oh, sorry, a, a quick, quick thing on Hannah's then I'll let you. Um, the organizations, um, their true values really shine through in the midst of failures, especially if it's a spectacular failure, and yeah. and even the values of the team and stuff really start to come mm -hmm. through. And so it's important, and I think our own personal values come through. And I think Diana spoke to us about you know no no blame, just move forward. That I, I think is that that's a mark of a good organization. There are many organizations where there would be blame going around. They aren't very successful and won't be around for long. But you need to, if you're part of an organization that doesn't handle that kind of thing well, it's important to you to pay attention to. And maybe that's a place that you shouldn't be, or maybe you have a part in that and can play a better role in making it better. But the values, your values, your team's values, the values of an organization, they are played out in, in crisis situations like that. Yeah, I would agree with that. I don't believe that you can be a good manager if you haven't failed. Like th that is such a powerful learning experience. And, and I'm a big believer in scar tissue. I think the mistakes or scars that we've earned over the years are probably what allows us to be as effective as we are. So when you're sitting with somebody who has maybe an experience they're not that proud of, and you ask them, what was your intent? What were you trying to do there? Oh, yeah, nice. And then when you say, oh, okay, I see. I see how you got there. Now, here's, you know, so intent for me is the most important thing. If somebody's really trying to do the well, or to do a job well, and it goes spectacularly wrong, but the intent was right, I'm fine with that. And, and we can work with that and we can correct that. But if the intent wasn't there or it was wrong intent, that's when I think it's a, it's a, a need for different intervention or, but any manager who's never failed, first of all, I, I'd like to meet him or her. And it's the failures I think that help us um, help others be more successful. Yeah, I like that, Greg, that um, the intent, right? If the intent is in the right place, if your heart's in the right place, um, how can you go wrong, right? It's that saying, if you make no mistakes, you're not trying hard enough, Yeah. right? Yeah, um, I have actually a bunch of questions, but some of them are repeated by our audience. So I think I think we'll switch and we'll get to some of these audience questions and uh, just to make sure that we get them all covered. Um, so we sort of, I think, addressed um, Natalie's question about uh, an international 
student who's starting over and, and Greg had some great advice about just really getting involved. Um, and then we're asked about, do you recognize courses or certificates from online platforms? And this is kind of an interesting one because there's so much amazing content online right now. Is that a great thing? Like, do you like seeing that on somebody's resume? And again, I, just feel free, the three of you, to just jump in and answer these questions. So continuous learning is, is fabulous. I don't, and it doesn't really matter to me what the form or format that they, people use. That's something that I really respect, taking courses, trying to advance, trying to understand. Sorry, I jumped in. I think, I think that's absolutely right, uh, especially showing showing that you're progressing and learning on your own. I think people need to own own their careers and 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 uh, and do that. My one caveat is um, I sometimes get resumes of folks that just have all the letters and all the stuff and but don't have any real experience. And so it's that hard balance. I'd rather see some of that. But some other interesting things like I joined, you know, a local, I joined my local KIPS organization, or I joined this thing, or even some extracurricular that's sort of attached to that, that isn't all just my, all my life and my time is taking online courses, get involved in the, in the community, whether it's the IT community or whether it's local community and do some stuff there. And that's how to differentiate yourself, I think, in, in, a, in a resume. It's always a flag for me when someone, all they have is, is all the letters. Mm. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. It's a good balance of um, of education and experience. And that experience doesn't have to necessarily be job related experience. It could be volunteering experience or being part of a network or an organization and and really having the balance. And uh, and like Greg said, just continuous learning, um, just continue to be curious and, and growing. And there's always something that all of us can learn and, and find what interests you, what you're passionate about and, and uh, go down that rabbit hole and, and uh, keep seeking to, to improve yourself. Yeah. You know what, again, I'm just gonna give another little round of applause to the people that showed up today because this particular event isn't a networking event, but there are so many free online networking events. And it's, you know, the, you, the fact that you're learning from these individuals and you're coming and connecting, um, that's, that's such a great, I just, again, um, um, wanting to make sure that everybody's here knows that we appreciate you being here. Um, and I love this next question, except for I really don't like that they define an older adult as, as over 40. I don't think that's true. <laughs> what advice do you have for someone who is trying to start their IT career as an older adult? Mm, I don't think technology knows the age. <laughs> I mean, I can go back and I think Adam dropped the uh, the COBOL language. Um, <laughs> but I think it doesn't, uh, for me anyways, um, I've never seen age as part of it. It's, it's all about attitude and education and having that uh, experience, whether it's within the same career path or not. Um, age I, for me has never factored into it. And I find sometimes um, mature students um, take things a little bit more seriously and they come to the table with a lot more of the soft skills, the durable skills that Greg was talking about. Yeah, I think uh, as someone who's just started to enter that older adult thing, um, it's, it's uh, I guess not just, I'm well into that now, but it's, uh, there's a lot of experience that you've got and a lot of skills that you bring that other people who are just in their career don't have. These durable skills we've been talking about, they build on each other. You learn this over your career and your, in, and your experience and stuff builds up. You've got all that. And so that's an ace up your sleeve, if that's the way the saying goes. An ace somewhere. A good ace is a good thing. It's good to have the ace. You got an ace. Uh, not a great card player, Adam. Or? <laughs> apparently, apparently not. Don't you should play poker with me because you would win. Uh, but that's you've got all that, and so use that and figure out how. I mean, the interesting stuff. Figure out what, how those things mesh together. What have you done in the past that IT has complimented? Why did you go into IT, and what is the compliment there for you? Um, and I think there can be some really interesting things there. Yeah, IT for me is not a. It's it's about how to help people do their jobs better. So if, if you're attitudinally correct, and Diana said that a couple of times already, then my belief is it doesn't matter <clears throat> whatever age you're going to be a good team member and help the team and the clients, whomever that is, be more successful. And that's what it's all about. So yeah. I, I wouldn't worry about age in that situation. 
Yeah, you sometimes have challenges, right? When you when you've got this, if you're if you're really actually just switching jobs and you now want to get different credentials to to apply for a job, and that's a that can be a challenge, right? Because what what are the credentials and experience you're looking for to get a, a reasonable job? So that can be an interesting mesh. You, you have to be able to get into the interview so you can talk to people and explain where you're at and why your why your story is interesting. But if you can make your resume interesting with enough of the credentials that you meet the meet the bar to get in, but enough of that interesting stuff, because that's that's what really when I'm looking at resumes, that's what I look at. I look at do you meet the bar? And now let's see what have you done that's really interesting that I want to talk to you more about. Yeah. And I think that networking thing again, right? Like if 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 I happen to meet you and then I discover that and they're like, wow, she's got, yeah, she's in the older category, all right, but she's got great enthusiasm. Um, you know, that I got a better, I got an in in terms of trying to land that that job. Um, this is a technical, more of a technical question. As a beginner, what's the most impactful or important programming language and framework nowadays for being a good software developer? Do you have a response on that one? COBOL, definitely mainframe COBOL. <laughs> An RPG. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think it depends. I'll take a crack at that. Um, I think it depends a lot on, on what your organization is. I think a lot of it's going to depend on where you want to work because different organizations are going to have different platforms where the College of Microsoft shop and I don't even know the languages that they use in there anymore. And so that's um, I can't help a lot with that. I know that there's a lot of there's a lot of different options that you can go in and look at, but try to figure out what you're trying to do and what the languages are to get there. You can learn languages once you've learned a couple, you pick them up. And so, and that's going to change over time anyway, because it's not going to be the next, you know, next shiny one's coming. And so how, how can you adapt? I think more of it's about what, what other value you can, you can add in there. So again, that's the interesting questions. What you can, you can program and that's all right. But I'm going to, especially if it's an entry-level program position, I can get lots of resumes that everyone's going to be able to do the language stuff. What else, what else do you have? What's makes you interesting in that, in that career? Why would I pick you over somebody else who also has that language? Yeah, I would agree with that. And also um, pick a focus. Like if you want to focus in on security or infrastructure or network uh, development, whether it's online or um, really try to pick a focus early on um, and explore that. Um, which languages you need for those, I don't know. But um, it's it's really just trying to understand what interests you. What are you passionate about? What are you curious about? What's what's going to get you up and excited and and learning more? Yeah, I would agree with that. It's mostly the people side that over the years has been the most interesting. So, if you have a chance to work with customers, if you have a internal and external, those are the areas. And whatever technically you're doing, working with customers and helping them be successful is going to stand you in good stead no matter where and what you do. So, yeah, just to add on to that, Greg, that's a great point. I think that a big turning point in my own career from being technical to, to being leader or just being more in the business is when I left IT and I was on the other side of the fence. I was the business, right? I was the one coming with the requirements and the, the system needs or the process needs and, and really understanding that IT provides solutions and they provide enablers, but they're not the ones necessarily driving what the business needs, what the requirements are. So for me, it was really important to be on both sides of that fence to really understand um, the, uh, the roles you play in, in those relationships and that IT shouldn't always be just coming forward with the, the latest, greatest new technology to solve a problem. You under, have to understand first what problem you're trying to solve and, and how does technology um, help to enable those solutions. Yeah, often in organizations, you're not looking, working with the new shiny stuff. You're working with what they've got because technology investment is really expensive. And maybe in a few years, you'll, you'll leapfrog and get to the next new shiny, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's hard. And so that way, if you can get up, the more opportunities you can take that are working with the business and understanding that business side, that's really because that's where you start to get to really add some value is you're starting to leverage that relationship, those relationships, and you can bring in that perspective. And so you can go back to the business and say, I understand what you're trying to do. And I can offer you this kind of a solution. And they go, you are a magician. Then people start to call you. That's what you want people to call you. Nice. Jonathan, can we run right to 730 with questions or do you need some time at the end? Is, is it, do you need a wrap up time or? Yeah, no, that should be good. Yeah, just as long right as we have, uh, you know, just one minute to wrap up at the end, then we should Okay, go. okay, because we've got some great 
questions and there's a couple here that I really would love to make sure that we get to. So um, one asks about, do you have recommendations of books to help further um, those durable skills, those interpersonal or durable skills? And then I want to get to the one about how do you stay current because that's a that's an important one. So let's uh, recommendation about books, but if you've got um, podcasts or a certain individual that you'd love uh, for us to hear about, everybody's scrambling to go get their favorite book. Uh, yeah, I've got everybody's got an answer to everybody. Wants okay, to get an right. I'll wait. Di Diana, we'll. Put the name and author in the chat too. Yeah, I will for sure. Um, essentialism, um, the disciplined pursuit of less um, was one that I really liked and it really helps you to take a lot of the noise and focus down on one or two things that are really important. Um, really, um, really enjoyed this book and it's a very easy read. Nice, great recommendation. And Adam, did you have one? I had a couple. So the, the ones I really like, and this is about team stuff. Um, Patrick Lancioni has a couple of books, The Five Dysfunctions of the Team. And there's another one. Shoot, I should remember what it is. Uh, anyway, if you look for his his books, uh, there's a number in there that you should definitely read. Um, and the Simon Sinek Start With Why yes. uh, is something you also need to read. It's been around for a while, but a goodie. So we've talked a lot about problem solving and I, I'm a big believer in uh, lateral thinking as I've said a couple times. And there's an author there, Edward de Bono. Um, he has a way of helping you understand literally how the mind works. So he was a medical doctor that wanted to understand how neurons synapse and, and what you could do to actually change and or have them synapse in ways that is beneficial to you. And that's his whole concept of lateral thinking and provocation techniques. That's one. And then one of my other heroes is Edwards Deming, <clears throat> statistician. We see full circle here. I started as a statistician. So every once in a while, I read a book by a statistician. Edwards Deming was a, a statistician who believed in process. And he was actually the one that went to Japan and helped the Japan auto industry create the concept of Kaizen or continuous improvement. And his thought process was, you can't get good until you can get consistent and you can't get consistent until you have a process. Once you have a process, you can fix it. If you have no process, you can't fix something. And if you can't have a, and if you don't have a process, you can't get consistent. So for me, excellence is always the end game after you've developed a bunch of processes and got your team thinking in that way so that continuous improvement is just a part of how you work. I have one more. Okay, one more, no ego. Uh, Cy Wakeman is uh, an incredible speaker. She's come to Winnipeg a few times uh, to talk about stuff and some of her team has too. The No Ego, she has a No Ego podcast that I listened to once or twice and then I got, I couldn't follow it because they were podcasts and we don't get along that well. Uh, but this is, uh, <laughs> her Her stuff is great. Okay, that's one of my favorite talk. I'm really jazzed about it. There's great energy now because I love this stuff. And uh, I really love too, um, how do you stay current? So um, tell us a little bit about that. And maybe it's, maybe it's sort of the same. Do you, uh, do you take courses yourself? Is, again, is there a, anybody that you follow or make some recommendations for students on, on that front too? Not just on durable skills, but on tech skill, like on technology. How do you stay on top of that? Are there newsletters you subscribe to? Oh, yes. <laughs> so hard. So I think most of us got a graduate degree at different points in our career. And during those graduate degree programs, we had to use different um, techniques or libraries to access information. So I'm a big fan of HBR, Harvard Business Review. I subscribe and just look at the headings. And almost always there's one each month that is interesting. And on the technology side, MIT or Sloan Magazine, um, or Sloan School of Business, and they have their own magazine. Those are two journals that come into my inbox, and I just scan through the titles. And almost always, there's one or two that I would find intriguing or interesting and take notes from. And it's just how I spend <laughs> five or 10 minutes every, every week trying to stay current. For me, I also, I follow a lot of the, um, the bigger consulting firms like McKinsey, I see there in the chat, um, Accenture, Boston Consulting Group, Forbes. 
Um, they have a lot of insights that are not just technology, but also problems in the business or, or trending in the business. And um, I find following the larger consulting groups really helps as well as like CIO magazine and uh, a few others uh, like vendors that I follow. And I think maintaining currency means different things as you progress in your career as well. Because as, as you're starting out, especially initially, your job is to be the technician and be good at the tech. Um, you need to figure out how to maintain the durable skills too and start to build those up. But maintaining currency means you are the person that the CIO or the other leaders will go to to say, where should we be taking this stuff? And right. what, is, what is the technology stuff? So I often send my technical leaders um, on tech conferences so they can learn about the tech stuff that's coming up. But they are also starting to read some of these journals so they can see the stuff that I'm reading because I'm reading the stuff like the CIO magazines and there's there's higher ed stuff that that are about what's happening in the industry. So it's industry stuff and so we know where things are going. And it's it's a lot about trends. And so, for example, in higher ed, we've got, there's a few organizations, one's Educause in the, uh, it's just in the States, but it's a global organization. And they publish, you know, here's, your, here's the top 10 trends in IT and higher ed. And you can watch these things, how they shift over time and see how they apply to your organization and stuff. So there's lots of those kind of things, but it is a lot of reading of articles and, and reading of news and stuff like that. And I think, like I said, I think it shifts. I, when I was earlier in my career, it was about what's the latest development in Lotus Notes, because I was a Lotus Notes guy, uh, which is still the best platform for development on. I don't yeah. debate anybody every day, even Al on that. No, it is by far and away, it could have, it, 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 it was just misunderstood. Um, um, and so, so, yeah. We have, uh, we have time for one question. So I'm going to just like make it a great big, huge fat question and wrap a whole bunch of things into this one question because it's our final one. Um, talk about the future. So there's some questions about us losing talent to the states. There's some questions around remote work. It's just like, where's IT going? Let's bundle all that up into what do you see for the future of IT? And you can touch on any one of those areas, but we have to make it quick because we've got to do it in like two minutes. So let's just hear some uh, quick thoughts from all of you. The future of IT in general. <laughs> As per Adam. <laughs> as, yeah, as, as, here's as, where, <laughs> hang on. If we write this down, here's where technology is going. Um, I, I can say from my point of view, I think a lot more stuff um, is going to be vendor driven. Uh, we're going to be doing it as a service model for a lot of stuff. You're going to have organizations that are going to be integrators. And so especially mid to large scale organizations are need to integrate all these pieces. I talk about the college. There's no college 2.0 that you can buy and install and run the entire college. So we are going to be integrators of technology. So when I'm hiring people, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, and then I'm going to outsource or offsource or offload onto these organizations. You, you'd be really good at running whatever that finance software is or whatever it is. And I'm going to integrate all that stuff together. I would agree. Um, that's, that's what I've seen the shift in the past several years is, is having other um, vendors be, be specialists and my team be more the um, liaison between the business and the solutions or the, the technology. Um, and we're the integrators, we're the sort of the solutions architect or the business architect and, and really understanding the business and having um, vendors that specialize in all the different technologies. So that way you don't have to have a massive, massive team with all these different specialists mm -hmm. that you can rely on those vendor partners to be the specialists in the technology. And and your group, or, or from my perspective, my group, just bringing it together for business solutions, business architecture, um, and being the, the, the integrators. I think we're going to see that the, the future is going to look a lot like the past, only faster, is my, is my perspective. So IT has changed so much in the last 20 years, it's mind-boggling. And the next 10 years is going to be the same journey, only quicker. Quantum's coming. AI, machine learning, there's so many things that are coming at us that are similar, different. And the key difference in my mind is speed. It's going to be really interesting to see how that uh, impacts us and society as a whole. So building your own, my view still, networks and relationships and trusted sources of information where you can go to ask questions and get answers that you can trust is going to become even more important because no one's going to be able to grasp all the different things that are happening. No one individual, no one organization. It's going to take a village to raise IT. <laughs> That's well said. Okay, on that note, I don't know about the audience. I hope the 
audience enjoyed this as much as I did because it just flew by and it was really fun talking to all three of you. So thank you, Jonathan, for having me. Thank you, um, Sips. And um, Jonathan, I'll turn it back to you and just sign off. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to echo that. I wanted to give a huge thank you to the panel for sharing all your amazingly invaluable insights. And uh, also a big thank you to you, Lori, for your amazing job as moderator. Uh, you know, we couldn't have such a great event today without you. So we really appreciate you taking your time. Uh, also just like to quickly mention that, uh, especially if you're watching the recorder recording, uh, if you're not a member, uh, we encourage you to become a member of KIPS. Uh, you can join at cips.ca slash membership, uh, especially if you're uh, a student and you're not yet a member, uh, student membership is free. So please uh, tell any other students that you know that are not currently a member of KIPS and uh, we hope you, you join us and attend future events like this great one as well. So thank you everyone for your time and looking forward to hopefully seeing you at the at future events. All right, thanks, thanks everyone. Y'all, have a nice evening. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Great.